I was taken along to church with my father practically every Sunday. And this began about the age of six when I was enlisted or enrolled as a member of the junior choir. And uh, it was so arranged that during the, the service as a church, I could sit there and the Sunday school had its little gathering near the same time so that if Father would take me to church with him, I could stay for practically two services. That little choir uh, had in it probably not less than 30 youngsters. And the man, Mr. Alexander Robinson, who was the uh, conductor, was another person who, out of sheer love for the church and a service, trained these young voices. He was not a voice teacher at all, but he was a person who liked music a great deal and understood enough to be able to give some service to the youngsters who were there. After a short while, I would say maybe even less than a year, well, uh, about that time, the group was singing so well that we sang for the big Sunday school, which convened in the afternoon. And along about the age of 10 or 11, um, I was given a, a piece of music, uh, and I would say about that time one was able to, by ear and with one finger, uh, work out certain melodies. But I was given a piece of music and told to take it home and look over it. And I was to sing the lower part, and the neighbor girl was to sing the upper part. That was a hymn from the Sunday School music book or hymnal, and it was called Dear to the Heart of the Shepherd. Oh, that's long ago. And uh, who was it? I believe the conductor himself came along to play the melody over. And in that period, too, there were one or two people who were interested that one would learn this, learn how to read music a little bit or follow a melody. And the dear to the heart of the shepherd, one heard often enough to get the melody. And then the other girl, whose name was Viola Johnson, came and we were rehearsing it together and then the day arrived when we were to sing it in church. And this is the first recollection of my uh, understanding of my father's uh, pride. Um, the day that the duet was sung, my mother, of course, was not there. It wasn't such a great event. And in any case, she had two big events at home to look after when I was away. Um, on the way home, my father stopped at my grandmother's house, which we had to pass if we took the direct route from the house, from the church to our house. And we stopped in the grandmother's house, and he talked there for a while, and I played around a bit. And by the time we arrived at our little house in Colorado Street, uh, the director of the choir, the children's choir, had already been there and left. And I remember that my mother told my father that Mr. Robinson had been there and he wanted to be sure that I, that Viola and I would be able to be in church, I think, earlier the next Sunday because there were going to be visitors and he wanted that we should sing for them. I only remember that my father said in reply to that, I'm not going to have them singing my child to death. <laughs> Oh, it was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> My first public appearance. <laughs> now, um, at this period, one simply sang without knowing uh, 
how you did it. And um, one sang that way for a long time. One sang that way until one had her first teacher. And so it was that when I went to Mrs. Patterson, I would say before I went to Mrs. Patterson, when my aunt would teach me something, uh, she would sometimes sing it for me, and I would sing it after her, but it had nothing to do with voice placement so far as that went. Now then, when I went to Mrs. Patterson, I was in school, and um, it was she who told me, who asked me how I produced a note. And I didn't know. I simply opened my mouth, and, and, and there it was. If she would touch the piano, if it happened to be a high note, one would sing it. If it was a low note, one would sing that. Because I believe, really, uh, that on the choir where we went when I was 13 years old, the senior choir, um, when one had the opportunity to sing the soprano, alto, tenor, or bass, well, the lower voices were sung an octave higher, when one had an opportunity to do that, the voice being natural and one having no inhibitions, if the tones were there to do, one did them without trouble, you see. And not that one's taking any credit for anything, but one did not have the trouble then. And so when I went to Mrs. Patterson and she said to me one day about a top note to do it, I wasn't thinking where it was done at all, and she said uh, that I should think about it and that she wanted me to throw it into the corner um, of the ceiling, just where the two walls met. There's just one little point there. That meant, although she did not use the word, to focus. And so um, I started out doing notes and trying always to push them there. In the beginning, I did not have, uh, I would say, 100% uh, 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 success in doing it, but there were some places where it came much easier to do it than others. But on the whole, it was not something which gave one a great deal of trouble. Only that I became aware for the first time that there were two ways of doing it. One was absolutely natural, and one was one that I had to think about. Whether it was uh, good to have it at that period or not, I did not stop to think. But I know if you're going to do anything, you have to know how you're going to do it and why you're doing it that way. And so we worked with Mrs. Patterson on that basis, that we would do what we were doing with a knowledge of how we were doing it. And Mrs. Patterson gave me my first Schubert. I believe I had from her my first Schubert song. When I left and went to South Philadelphia High School, almost immediately, the principal, who was Dr. Lucy Wilson, became interested, and she uh, used to have for assembly uh, lecturers or someone to play the piano or sing, and among the people whom she had was a young woman by the name of Sarah Stein, and the day that Sarah Stein was there, Dr. Wilson had me sing in the assembly. One of the girls in school played. I don't remember what it was that I sang at all. But after the uh, assembly was over, Dr. Wilson told me that she wanted to see me in the office. And I went to her office after getting permission from my class teacher. And Dr. Wilson told me that her friend, Miss Stein, wanted me to meet her teacher. But, said Dr. Wilson, I would like that you would also sing for someone else. 
And it was a few weeks later that she told me, as I remember a few weeks later, that she told me the person for whom she wanted me to sing was David Biston. And the person whom Sarah Stein wanted me to sing for was Mr. Boghetti. As time passed, the appointments were made with both of these men, and I went to sing for David Biston. And he was quite interested. I went to sing for Mr. Boghetti, and before we sang for him, he immediately said that he didn't have time. He didn't have time to take on any pupils at all. He was much too busy, but he was giving me a half an hour of his precious time uh, just because his star pupil had asked him to do so, and so and so and so and so and so and so. Dr. Wilson, from outward appearance, was not very happy about this introduction. And uh, so the song which we sang for Mr. Boghetti was Deep River. And uh, after it was finished, he said, uh, I will make room for you right away, and I will only need you two years. After that, you can go anywhere and sing for anybody that you want. And he began to say uh, what his lessons would cost and so forth and so on, as if we were going to him right away. Well, of course, there wasn't money then for lessons or anything of the sort. But Dr. Wilson wanted to make some arrangement by which one would begin uh, uh, study with such a teacher if it were possible. In the studio of Mr. Bovetti, one had a completely new and different kind of uh, training. The throwing of the voice to the ceiling, to the corner, uh, didn't seem to interest him so much as trying to put it high into the head. As a matter of fact, we started out by doing exercises that you would hum until you could feel the vibration, and then you would place your tone where you were humming. The idea is a little bit like that which, Miss, uh, which Mrs. Patterson had, only that she wanted it to get outside of you, and Mr. Boghetti wanted you to focus it inside so that you could feel it where you were. We did many exercises working from the tone above which he thought was the best to those either side of it to keep it on the same level and never to drop it um, the doing doing of the when we had exercises which we uh, started with which we started every lesson um, there was always the idea of keeping the tone high and to focus it. No matter how low it was, it was to be focused high. It made for a continuous line from the lowest tone to the highest. Here, too, with Mr. Boghetti, we had some breathing. Uh, that is, that the sides were held, the ribs were held, and uh, rather tightly, and you had to breathe out and see how far you could expand them. Um, it worked all right, but after getting into the singing, when songs were given, I did not always check to see whether one was breathing that way or whether one was breathing naturally because I felt if the breathing was natural, that that was the thing that one was most called upon to do. You needed a maximum amount of breath, and you needed it in the most natural way possible. Um, the exercises with Mr. Bogetti were not only confined to uh, the middle and the upper middle and the lower voice, but we went up the scale and um, to an A, to a B, and uh, I think on very seldom occasions, uh, to a C, G. 
just running up and touching and coming back. And there was uh, a time when we were working for agility, and most all of the exercises that we had were uh, very fast and were done in a very light fashion, so that some of the songs that were done by soprano and that had runs in, one would get them maybe in a little lower key and do them with the embellishment. The um, trill at that particular time posed no problem at all. And as a matter of fact, if there were not trills in some things, uh, it was not uncommon that Mr. Borghetti might uh, insert one toward the end of the song. Costi Behanen, whose name I've mentioned several times as my accompanist, uh, came from Finland, that is, Finland was his land, and uh, he was very proud of anything that was Finnish, and most certainly uh, very, very delighted that they, there was such a composer as Sibelius. And it was Kosti who introduced me to the music of Sibelius. Uh, we had gone over several songs, and uh, there was one song in particular that's called N-O-R-D-E-N. -E they called it Nurden, I believe. And uh, it was beautiful in a strange way. But it all seemed to me to be so very foreign. I couldn't quite, quite, quite grasp it. And so one day, Costi said to me, You know, Marion, I think it would be a very nice thing to sing some of the Sibelius songs when we go to Finland. We had, I think, about six or eight concerts in Finland. And he said, uh, and while you're there, maybe we can go and see him. Oh, I said, I doubt that we could see him. He said, you, let, you wait, I think maybe I can arrange. And so he did arrange. And we went to Sibelius to sing for him some of the songs which Kosti had taught me, and to, at the same time, get the reaction of Sibelius and get his criticism. And so we were told before we went that he would have just a half an hour. And I understand also that, uh, I understood also that we were to have coffee while we were there. So we began to uh, do the numbers, and uh, I believe Norden was one of them, and there was uh, one that uh, had a German text, Im Wald ein Mädchen singt. And um, there were probably two others which we did, but I remember that Sibelius, who was not quite as tall as I'd expected him to be, whose head was quite bald and quite like his whole face, and his, his, the whole head looked like something that had been chiseled out of marble. And uh, it's a very, very strong face. And so we sang, and he came over to me, embraced me, and said, My roof is too low for you. And then he said in a loud voice, champagne, champagne, not coffee. Uh, we stayed there, uh, needless to say, a bit more than the half an hour. And I came away having felt very rewarded for having had this experience. And as if a sort of veil or curtain had been lifted. One approached the songs of Sibelius and the songs of Scandinavia in a different way. Uh, when we were in Europe and we were in Scandinavia and we went to um, Stockholm, the manager there, Helma Enval, was a man who was uh, a very alert person. 
there came the time when Mr. Enval decided it would be a good idea to go to London to give a concert uh, on one's own in a big place, I mean in one of the concert halls. And he also wanted that one should appear in Paris. And so he wrote to uh, the office of uh, Mr. Holt, and uh, he also wrote to the office of someone else, and his name I will think of a little later. So we went to this person who uh, had a, a concert agency, and he arranged a concert for us in Paris, and Mr. Horvitz, who had been in Europe before with Wolf of Sachs, and who was then in, who was now in, uh, oh, who was at that time in Paris, arranged a concert in Paris. Uh, Mr. Enval uh, came with us. He and his wife came down, and the three of us uh, stayed uh, uh, in Paris for several days and uh, had this concert at Salgavo. And um, I am not sure whether it was this first concert or whether it was another one. But in any case, at one of these concerts, um, Mr. Urock came and came back in the intermission. Now, it will be interesting to know that before I had gone away the second time, I had tried desperately to meet Mr. Urock, and it had been a matter of utter impossibility. Um, I can't tell you that I went to his office and sat outside and waited to see him come in. I didn't do that. But other means of trying to meet him failed. Just absolutely could not. And here all at once was Mr. Hirok backstage with Mr. Horvitz. I couldn't believe my eyes. And uh, when he said he would like to see me the next day at Mr. Horvitz's office, well, I don't know exactly how I got through with the rest of the program, but it finally, like all things, came to an end. And Costi, my accompanist, and I went to the office of Mr. Horvitz to meet Mr. Hurok. And the picture I shall never forget. Mr. Horvitz sat, uh, oh, to one side of the desk, facing it. And when Costi and I came in, we sat in the other two chairs, also facing the big chair behind the desk. And Mr. Hurok sat in that big chair. And I don't know what has happened with him and his weight since then, but he looked at that time to be at least three times, I'll say twice and a half without any exaggeration, the size that he is now. It was probably just in our eyes because he had meant to me, his name had meant to me and what he had done, uh, what I had hoped might be able to be done for me. And so uh, he had a cane which he put on the desk in front of him. And he sat there and his shoulders looked so broad and he looked so tremendous. And uh, I don't know how cost he felt, but I felt very inadequate for the whole thing and would have run away if I could like mad. But uh, we had this conference to go through with and uh, I remembered Mr. Hurok wanted to know how many concerts I had in the United States, how much money I received for them, and everything about them. And uh, he, I don't remember even whether he said he liked the concert the night before, but I do remember him saying that uh, he thought that he might be able to do something for me. And uh, when the conference was over, I felt as much, I felt as probably some marathon runner must have felt after he had finished <laughs> uh, a long race. And my accompanist said, uh, Marion, the only thing that I know to do now is to have a schnapps and get living once more, something to that effect. But he, he too, was terribly excited about the whole thing and, and, and not knowing exactly how he felt, you see. Now, regardless of my feelings in the matter, 
I, I, I know that it would not have been right not to have followed the plan laid out to appear in Washington. That was not too far away from my nature to accept. Because in anything, I think you cannot accomplish anything if you run away from it. But I think if you have something to offer which can uh, help a situation, and you feel that it is sufficiently uh, uh, sincere to make an impression, then I think you should do it in your own manner. Uh, when we arrived in Washington, there are some details, of course, which I shall really have to brush up on. Because on that occasion, so many things happened thick and fast that unless you stand off from it and look at it, you don't remember all of them. But one arrived in the afternoon early, and already there were some people milling about. I say early because we got in maybe two or three hours ahead of time. And I believe we stayed at the home of the, uh, it had been the home of Governor Pinchot, as I remember. And uh, we prepared ourselves, went over to see how the piano, we went first really to see how the piano was situated and about the public address system. And when we went back that afternoon for the performance, I had such a feeling that I had never had before. The only thing that came near to it was the time when when uh, Toscanini came backstage in Southport. My heart was throbbing to the point that I could scarcely hear anything. And there was an excitement that made one, well, you, well, you just couldn't, one couldn't say anything. And I remember that <coughs> there were policemen who came to the car and escorted one through a small corridor which police in the front had made in order that we might be able to go up to the mine. We went into a little room behind there. We were acquainted with the order of the program. I met Mr. Itchers. I knew in the meantime some of the things that he was doing and working very hard to achieve. And I knew of one of our own lawyers in New York, in uh, Washington, who was working equally as hard in other sections. And, uh, then came the signal that we were to go out. And when we went out onto the steps, there was a multitude such as you could only, well, imagine um, in your wildest imagination. You could only expect to see something like that. It seemed to me as far as the eye could go, directly in front of me there were people and on either side all kinds of people and everyone there with a sort of, uh, of well I had the feeling that everyone wanted to show their well how can I express that they, they wanted to show that they were with one and as the program went on and we stood there at, at our part to, to give our performance, things at this time sort of went away for a moment. And I remember that as well as I know our national anthem, for a while one was carried away to the point that the words did not come. There was such an emotional uh, upheaval that I wonder now, as I look back, just how we might have come to the end of the program. I was naturally concerned with how the voice might sound, how the whole performance would come off. But that seemed to be secondary as far as many of the people who were there were concerned. 
they were there to see that a principle was they were there because a principle was involved and they wanted to show on what side the fence they might on some of these occasions you go you give your heart in order that the performance may be what you would want it and from your point of view it does not come off the way that you want it at all some of these times a critic will write that the concert was the best one that you had given in that particular city um, some other times you will go and you will feel that it is not what it should be and the critic will bear you out in saying so other times you will go to a concert hall and you will feel just absolutely that you'd rather do anything than give a concert and some spark happens to fly about you catch it and your audience does and it can be one of your finest performances on the other hand you can go in and feel very fine and something comes along and the performance isn't so good however in all of this you must have some foundation you must have a foundation which is sufficiently secure that whatever condition you are in that you will be able to give a performance it may not come up at all to your standard but you will be able to give a performance I say that because there are there, there seems to be uh, a feeling that I say seems to be a feeling I know Crosby and I used to talk about it a great deal and we came to the conclusion that a person who studies uh, long and seriously and has a good foundation cannot one night sing as he would say like a god and the next night sing like the very opposite if he has foundation it means that his artistry would certainly be there even if the voice isn't so that a, a, a performance he could give and that is why I believe that a, a, a firm foundation is a thing that is tremendously important last September uh, at the opening of the ballet Mr. Hurok gave one of his fabulous parties afterwards and my husband and I were invited and uh, got in at the doorway we met a few people whom we knew and then we were ushered into the big room and almost immediately uh, I saw Mr. Bing and uh, he came over and spoke and without any ceremony at all he said uh, uh, would you be interested in singing with the Metropolitan so I looked at him uh, rather strangely strangely probably is not the word I looked at him in some surprise to see if he you know was serious about it and he said uh, would you would you be interested so it was very casual and so I said as casual as casually as I could uh, oh I think I would he said do you really think you would I said yes I think I would he said, well, then, would you call me then uh, tomorrow morning or whatever morning it was? I said, uh, yes, I will. And uh, then he said, uh, oh, here comes Max Rudolph. And he introduced me to Mr. Rudolph. And, he, and so the next morning, I believe it was, Miss Stroman spoke with Mr. Rudolph. And Mr. Rudolph told her that the opera was The Masked Ball. And the part that they were interested that I should look at was Ulrika. And that night, they definitely said, we would like you to look at the part and see what you think of it. Um, 
So when the book was sent over to the office, the office got it immediately to me. And I looked over the part and found that it was, in my opinion, too high. And I was told that Metropolis would probably conduct it and that after I looked over it sufficiently that I should go to Metropolis to have him listen and get his opinion. And so I worked with Paul Meyer for quite some time with it and it was Paul Meyer who went with me to the audition for Metropolis whom I had met many years ago in uh, Monte Carlo and sang with his orchestra probably the first time I was ever in southern France. Well, um, we went that morning and we were there probably, oh well, rather a short time. We went through the big aria, which has an A, which you will have to hold quite some time. And I will say in all frankness that um, over a period of years, you do the same thing. It becomes a sort of routine, and you don't have the impetus that you should be able to maintain on your own to keep things on the level that they should stay. And so when it came about that one had the opportunity to learn the role, there were difficulties which one shouldn't have had if one had applied herself all along the way, as she should. And so when we had this uh, uh, audition, uh, I said to Metropolis before we started, I said, now, this, to my opinion, is too high for me. He said, well, sing it through and we will see. And so when we did it, we came to the A, and I don't like singing high things in the morning, anyhow, and this was in the morning, and when we came to the A, uh, it was sort of pressed out in one way or the other, and uh, I looked at him as we did it, he was looking at his score, and showed no sign of anything at all, which was just wonderful, and then when we finished what we were doing, we sang another part, and then he said, well... I think there, he said, on the high, you just don't know it yet. He said, I think when you know it, it will go. I said, well, I'm not too sure, but I said, I would like to have another week, another ten days, and then come back. He said, well, all right. So uh, we left, and I went up to the apartment the long way. As a matter of fact, I took the bus uptown, and uh, when I got in the door, the phone was ringing madly. And I took up the receiver, and my accompanist was on the phone. He said, Marion, uh, Mr. Hurok is trying to get you like mad. Uh, and he tried to reach you here. He said, he wants you to call him right away. It is something very important. I don't know what it is, but he wants you to call him right away. So I said, all right. And then I called Mr. Hero, and he was in the office. And it wasn't the day which I had expected him to be in the office at all. So he said, congratulations. I said, beg pardon? He said, congratulations. I said, I don't know what, what you mean, but... Uh, he said again, congratulations. I said, well, let me sit down first, and then I, 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 said, I will try to, to know what you mean. He said uh, again, congratulations. We are to meet this afternoon at the Metropolitan to sign contracts. Just as simple as that. Well, then I really had to sit down. And I was absolutely flabbergasted because Metropolis had not told me that he was going to say to anyone that he thought the part, uh, that one would be able to, to sing the part. And I found out later that Metropolis had called Mr. Bing, 
Mr. Bing had called Mr. Hillock. And all of this must have happened within, well, within the three quarters of an hour, or an hour after I had left Metropolis. He had given me no inkling that he had the slightest intention of calling anybody before the next week or ten days when I would go back to make a second try. And, of course, the excitement was just too much. 